signal acquisition Cuervo. From Boeing Starliner to other commercial payloads, the Atlas V is one of America's best expendable launch vehicles. Setting the Atlas V apart from its predecessors is its new rigid body Common Core Booster that serves as the rocket's first stage. The Common Core Booster replaces the main body type used by previous Atlas vehicles, which we will cover shortly. The stage is used in all of the various configurations of the Atlas V family, along with the Stretch Centaur upper stage. The Atlas V comes with a multitude of configurations based on fairing diameter size, the number of integrated solid boosters, and the number of engines on its upper stage. The solid boosters are sometimes added asymmetrically, but increase the payload total for the launch vehicle. At an upper limit of 17,720 kilograms, the Atlas V is a key payload launcher today. Since 2002, the Atlas V has sent multiple payloads into space in a variety of missions for various commercial and government partners. It belongs, however, to a much longer line of launch vehicles who started as the USA's first intercontinental ballistic missiles for the then called Army Air Forces with an awarded research contract in 1946. Since then, the Atlas system has been synonymous with US spaceflight. With planned missions for NASA's commercial crew services into the late 2020s, the original Atlas platform and its many advanced derivations will approach 70 years of service this decade. The original SM-65 or Atlas missile would have the peculiar use of what are called balloon tanks, made of thin stainless steel with minimal support structures. The pressure inside the tanks would provide rigidity during the flight. For this reason, if kept unpressurized, an Atlas booster would collapse under its own weight. A pressure of 34 kilopascals or 5 psi usually of nitrogen gas, would keep the tanks rigid at all times. The stainless steel that was welded together to make the rocket's tanks was a thin Type 301 stainless steel sheet which was prone to corrosion and cracking in heat affected areas. The issues were worse near Oceanside launch platforms. Working with the rocket chemical company of San Diego and 40 formulaic attempts later, water displacing Formula 40 or WD-40 would be produced keep the Atlas's rocket skin intact and our home cabin and hinges from squeaking. Atlas would have a three engine configuration at launch, a dedicated sustainer engine that would always be firing until suborbital or orbital trajectory and two booster engines that would provide more thrust while ascending the more dense parts of the atmosphere. At the time there wasn't much research on air igniting engines and therefore Atlas was designed to light all engines on the ground. The booster engines would be shut off and dropped during the flight but no tanks would drop with them. This gave rise to the term stage and a half for the Atlas rocket. Since all of the engines were feeding from the same tank, all three would have to use the same propellants as fuel. The difference would be in each engine's design efficiency. The LR-105 sustainer engine was designed for near vacuum environments producing just 252 kilonewtons of thrust. The booster LR-89s, however, were designed for sea level firing with each producing 726 kilonewtons of thrust per engine. Using ground radio for guidance, Atlas would take in inertial system information from ground stations. Atlas had two small vernier engines that would continuously control roll and fine-tune targeting, while being helped by the booster engines in early flight that also controlled pitch and yaw control. For the later stage of the flight, the sustainer engines gimbaled input and the verniers would keep Atlas on track. While Atlas A, B, and C were kept as ICBM missiles for testing, it wasn't until Atlas D that production officially began with a successful missile launch in July of 1959. As a missile, it would remain on inventory until 1967 with the emergence of Titan. For orbital operations, it was split between the LV-3A for the Agena upper stages, the LV-3B for Mercury upper stages, called Atlas Mercury, and shortly thereafter for LV-3C, using the first Centaur upper stage. Atlas E and F models had slight differences in their fuel line components. In the 60s, more than 200 were built as Atlas missiles but later found life as expendable launch vehicles in the 80s, capable of placing 820 kilogram payloads into low Earth orbit. Some Atlas E rockets were also used with Agena, Able, and Centaur upper stages as well. Atlas H was a further improved version, which in the 80s had several surplus missiles converted to orbital launch vehicles. Several were launched with electronic intelligence payloads for the Naval Ocean Surveillance System run by the U.S. Navy. Following the low 170 kilogram payload on the Atlas Able, 
for the Atlas D and Able IV upper stage, better variants became available. The Atlas Agena B, using the same Atlas D and Agena B upper stage, could place a payload of 2,627 kilograms into low Earth orbit, just short of the Atlas Agena D, which could put 2,718 kilograms into low Earth orbit. It would be the Atlas Centaur, with Atlas D and Centaur upper stage by General Dynamics, that really allowed NASA to put large payloads into space. For the limit of 4,670 kilograms into low Earth orbit, over multiple improvements during testing, a real dependable launch vehicle emerged. Known after its testing phase as the Atlas I, it would place up to 3,630 kilograms into low Earth orbit from 1990 until 1997. Beginning with the Atlas II, major engine changes took place on the booster. The LR-89 booster engines were replaced with Rocketdyne's RS-56 OBA engines with 1,047 kilonewtons of thrust each. The LR-105 sustainer engine was replaced with the RS-56 OSA with 386 kilonewtons of thrust. While both new engines had slight increases in efficiency, they were also newer versions of the RS-27 engine lineage from the Delta rocket series which was in active production. The LR-101 verniers were also removed with the Atlas II. While not covered in detail in this video, by this time on the Atlas II, the Centaur 2A upper stage was being used. Its insulated balloon tanks can be seen here along with its dual RL-10A4 Hydrolox engines. The Atlas 2AS variant used two Castor 4 solid fuel boosters which were attached to the first stage. The solid boosters increased the payload to low Earth orbit to 8,610 kilograms. This vehicle was used from 1993 until 2005 with a total of 30 flights completed. Beginning with the Atlas 3, the Energomash RD-180 engine from Russia is used. While the political implications of using the RD-180 stem from the thawing of relations after the Cold War, after testing the engine alone, it was thought it could provide much better efficiency and thrust than its closest Atlas engine predecessors. The Atlas III would be paired with either a single engine or dual engine Centaur upper stage and provide low Earth orbit payloads of up to 8,640 kilograms. The Atlas III would fly from 2000 to 2005 while laying down the groundwork for the Atlas V we know today. The same RD-180 engines that remain fly today on the Atlas V and will power payloads into space as the platform is retired this decade. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed content like this, please consider subscribing, liking, sharing, and commenting on this and other future videos. Also, remember to follow us on Twitter and Instagram for more space content.